For those here this evening in the sanctuary, if you happen to be listening online, either through our radio station um, or online uh, through our website, also if you're watching the, the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, I want to welcome you here to Grants Pass, Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, where we seek out the Lord. We want to go deeper in his word, deeper in prayer. We read, we study the Bible line upon line, verse by verse chapter by chapter and book by book. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 21. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of a a, a recap, a review. We're going to start it in in verse 3. John, chapter 1, excuse me, John, chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning, excuse me, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. Verse six. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him who you are, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening. And as as always, my prayer is that we hear from you. Lord, that through your spirit, just speak to each one of us what we need to hear, Lord. We just ask that you move amongst us and by your spirit to teach us Encourage us, convict us, comfort us. In the name of your son, in the name of Jesus, amen. So in our passage of scripture this evening, it is after, as we know, that after the resurrection of Jesus. It is also after the upper room appearances of Jesus where he suddenly appeared to his disciples, not once, but twice within an eight-day period allowing them to see him, allowing them to hear him and touch him, proving he was and is alive. Jesus is alive, resurrected. The disciples now knew that death could not hold him. Even doubting Thomas, he got to put his fingers in the wounds of Jesus. Thus proving Jesus' own prophetic words in John chapter 2, verse 19. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. His words were real. And as scripture says, his disciples would recall his prophecies after the fact. And they would believe that Jesus was, is the Son of God. And in the last meeting in the upper room, Jesus would breathe on the disciples. He would breathe into the disciples, the Holy Spirit, enlisting them and enabling them in the work of the ministry for the work of the ministry. John chapter 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The word for breathe is the same word used at the beginning of mankind. When in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God, Elohim, formed Adam 
out of the dust and breathed life into him. Here, in this passage, Jesus breathed on and in his disciples, and then he spoke to them to what? To receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. The word to receive there is lambano. It means to take upon one's self, to claim, to seize and lay hold of. Receive. It is an action made by a decision. To seize and lay hold of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person, part of the Trinity. And just as the woman who saw Jesus after his resurrection laid hold of Jesus by wrapping their arms around him as to not let him go, we need to seize the Holy Spirit to allow him to come upon our lives and walk with us in our Christian lives. For we need the Holy Spirit to be victorious in our Christian walk. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Believers have the indwelling spirit of Christ, the comforter who proceeds from the father. In John chapter 15, verse 26, it says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit assists us in prayer. You can read that in Jude chapter one, verse 20, and intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God, Romans 8, 27. He also leads the believer into righteousness and produces his fruit in those yielded to him, Galatians 5, 16 through 23. Believers, we are to submit to the will of God and walk in the spirit. When I say walk, that is just a metaphor for our practical daily living. How we live our lives. The Christian life, it is a journey. And we are to walk it with a consistent forward motion. We are to progress in our Christian faith, in our Christian walk. To always be growing, learning to be more, what? Christ-like through the guidance of God's word and his Holy Spirit. As believers, we should walk in the spirit. Galatians 5.25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. In other words, the spirit is what gives us life in the new birth. John chapter three, verse six tells us that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And we must continue to live day by day in the spirit. Walking in the Holy Spirit means yielding, yielding to his control. See, it's a decision. Receive the Holy Spirit. We follow his lead and we allow him to have his influence over us so that the spirit of God rules over our flesh. It is a constant battle to do God's will versus our will, our fleshly desires. And the disciples would need the control of the Holy Spirit to do God's will will. To advance the work of God here on earth, Jesus had started the work. Now the disciples, the church, would continue it. Now with the festival being over in Jerusalem, the disciples, they are back in Galilee, their home turf. It was where they were supposed to be. They were told to go to Galilee numerous times after the resurrection and that Jesus would find them there. Jesus himself told them that after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Matthew 26, verse 32. The disciples were waiting, waiting for the Lord to come meet them. 
Now, we are not told how long they waited, how long Peter waited. But after a certain period of time, Peter, he gets impatient and decides it's time to get busy. I can imagine his conversation with the boys prior to verse 3 in this chapter. We've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Where's Jesus? He said he would meet us here. Where? It's been days. Where is he? He's a no-show. You know what? I'm going fishing. I'm tired of waiting. I'm going fishing. How often have you felt in your life like God has been a no-show? Or you were disappointed in God because of a certain situation. It didn't pan out the way you expected it to. God didn't meet your timetable. (laughs) So you moved on without him. You acted without the Lord. Or maybe you threw out a quick Hail Mary fast food prayer and then went into get her done mode taking care of business. I'm a man of action. I'm a woman of action. I'm going to get things done. Do you know how many verses in Scripture speak about waiting on or for the Lord? I looked it up. I stopped counting at 50. 50, I stopped counting, and I'm sure there's more. 50 plus verses of God's word telling us to wait on or for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently. Psalm 135, I wait for the Lord, and in his word do I hope. Isaiah 40, 31, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. The list goes on and on and on. Scripture continually says, God continually tells us to wait on or for the Lord. And it's not that God is telling us to wait to punish us or to torture us. Remember, I've said this. Remember God's ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. We must understand that we do not have all the information, all the facts. We see through a glass dimly. But God knows all. And he always has a purpose. He always has a reason. And he always has a plan. A certain situation comes up in our lives. And we react without really praying or waiting. See, we think we know or we assume and we act on that assumption. We try to handle the situation in and of ourselves. We deal with with the situation in our flesh and not in the wisdom or the spirit of God. Who's been guilty of that? Oh, wow, I should see more hands up here. (laughs) We in our flesh, in all honesty, in our flesh just seem to not be able to control our bodies. We are unable to control our tongues. It is amazing how something so small can get us in so much trouble. We get ourselves in trouble. God has to continually instruct, continually remind us to wait, to wait on him for a reason, which is to be led by divine guidance, his spirit, before we react to something in our lives, something that bothers us, that gets us in a huff, something we don't agree with or understand. Stop and remember to pray. Pray and wait on the Lord. Be patient 
and trust that God is working before you try to handle the situation, to deal with the issue, to solve the problem. Because without prayer and without waiting on God, we are in our flesh. And that's not good. Wait on the Lord for his timing and wait for his guidance. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, we cannot go wrong. We cannot go wrong. And whatever happens, that's part of God's plan when we're in the Spirit. Jesus hadn't shown himself. So Pete decides to go fishing. And six others go with him. And verse 3 says that they fished all night, catching nothing. Then verse 4 says that when morning came, Jesus was there on the shore. But the disciples, they didn't recognize him. It's interesting that they didn't recognize him. This is after Jesus showed himself to them in the upper room, not once, but twice. They still don't recognize him, maybe because they were 100 yards off. But in verse 5, he, Jesus, he asks if they have any food. What he's really asking is, hey, have you caught anything? Have you been successful in your own strength? He already knows the answer. They all together, no. Then in verse 6, he tells them to cast the net on the other side, the right side. Now, I mentioned this on Sunday, that we are not to get caught up in the right side as the right versus the left side as being the wrong. The theological principle here is in your job, in your work, in your family, in your marriage, in your ministry, are you doing it in your strength, your wisdom, your flesh, or in God's divine strength, his wisdom, his spirit? We are to cast our net where God tells us to. So the boys, and that's really what the word children means, is boys. They follow the instructions from Jesus on the shore. Now remember, at this point, they still do not, do not know that it is Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus speaking to them. These seasoned fishermen, they take advice from a total stranger on the shore. They are so tired. Weary, discouraged. All right. I don't know who this person is, but let's take his advice. It is important in application that when we are down, when we are discouraged, when we are at our wits' end, that we seek counsel, that we take counsel from a godly source. First and foremost, the Bible, the word of God, in prayer to Father in heaven. And then from godly men or women led by the Holy Spirit, I am amazed that believers in Christ go to mediums, fortune tellers, they read the astrology charts. Astrology, divination, wizardry. That is all from Satan. It doesn't matter if they're good wizards. That is from Satan. To deceive, to divide us from God. And speaking of deceiving and dividing, these are the two main weapons of Satan on his attack of believers and the church. To deceive believers with his lies and then to divide the believers from one another. It's military strategy 101. Divide and conquer. And he's been doing it for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. Thanks be to God that this stranger on the shore advising the disciples was is God. 
Think about that. They didn't know. Yet they were so weary and discouraged. Ah, let's try it. Cast the net on the right side. Now, with the boat, it was only about six to eight feet from one side to the other. So it really shouldn't have mattered which side. I mean, if a school of fish are there, they really should also be right there. Just as Jesus knew where his disciples were when he showed up on the shore and what they were doing, he also knew where the fish were. And I believe he just commanded the fish just to leap, to swim into the net. And the net became full of catch. And upon seeing this, it says, John recognized it was Jesus. He didn't recognize Jesus earlier, even when Jesus spoke to him. Have you caught anything? John didn't go, wait, that's Jesus. No. It's after he saw this miracle. Two and two. Wow, that's Jesus. It is the Lord, verse seven. And upon hearing this, Pete, <laughs> he throws himself into the water. The word is balo. Other translations will have cast, plunge, jump, dive. It means to let go without caring. Peter just lets go the cares of the day, the cares of the world. He doesn't care about the fish. He doesn't care about the boat. Doesn't care how far he is from shore. The only thought on his mind, the only thought, the most important thing to him, which filled his brain completely, Jesus. And he just dives in. Verse 8, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. It's about 100 yards. So picture the scene as the small boat came into the shallows. The other half dozen disciples, they poured over the side and they waded ashore, pulling the heavy dragnet with them, bursting with fish. It was all so natural, yet supercharged with the supernatural. Verse 9, then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. They saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. So Jesus had already started a meal for them with provisions he already had. This is the only place in scripture that we read of Jesus cooking, preparing a meal. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> Fish, bread, on a fire. Who gets there first? Pete, Peter. I'm sure these components caught Peter's eye, probed his conscience. God always has a reason, always has a purpose, always has a plan. First, a fire of charcoal, a fire of coals. Like the one Peter warmed his hands that fateful night when he stood and partook of what the world had to offer after denying Jesus. Remember that? He stood with them, warming himself by the fire. The word for coals is the same. In both passages here, and when Peter, after denying Jesus, went and stood with the enemy, with the world. Second, the fish and the bread. Okay. Peter's coming up. He sees the fire of coals. And now, fish and bread, the same meal Jesus had provided to feed the multitudes. 
The word used for fish broiling on a fire of charcoals is found only in the Gospel of John. John used this word to describe the two fish used to feed the thousands in John chapter 6, verses 9 and 11. As Peter comes out of the water, dripping wet, he sees the fish and bread. He smells the fire, feels its warmth. And his mind recalls the phenomenon of the feeding of thousands with a few fish and loaves of bread and his failure to his Lord, Master, when because of fear of man, he denied Jesus three times. Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So Jesus allows them to not only partake of his meal, but he allows them to add to it. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. So Jesus says, hey, bring some of the fish. And Peter, single-handedly, he drags the net to land. What an amazing tribute to his strength with this net full of fish, close to 250, 300 pounds. Pete was no weakling. The full and unbroken net also had a message for Peter of an earlier encounter with fish and Jesus. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Just one book in front of John. Luke chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 4. Luke 5. We're going to read verses 4 through 8. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Watch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon Peter answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I'm sure he remembered that. Though he had doubts, he still obeyed Jesus' command. Nevertheless, at your word. Here in John chapter 21, when Pete hears Jesus' command to bring some fish, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't even look to the others for help. He just goes and he gets it done. When Jesus commands us to do something, Don't hesitate. When you know it is from God, boom, do it. Now, why in this verse 153 fish? Okay, we got some time. There are a few different explanations and theories. The simplest explanation is given by St. Jerome. He said that in the sea, there are 153 different kinds of fishes and that this catch is one which includes every kind of fish, therefore symbolizing the fact that someday men of all nations will be gathered together to Jesus. And since the net was unbroken, the net stands for the church. And there is room in the church for all men of all nations. Another explanation comes from Cyril of Alexandria. He breaks the number 153 into three simple elements. 100 plus 50 plus three. So the number 100 is said to represent the fullness of the Gentiles. 100 is the fullest number. It is also a number used to describe the Lord's flock. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, it says, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep 
and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 to go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And the 50 is said to represent the remnant of Israel, those who would be gathered in. And then finally the three, which stands for the Trinity, to whose glory all things are done. God the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The number 153 could also just be an eyewitness account from John. Of how many fish were in the net? John, he was a fisherman and he was meticulous in his details of his gospel. And he was practical. Having an exact count meant that they were able to equally divide the bounty between them. We're not sure, but verse 12 says, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him who you are, knowing that it was the Lord. So here we have Jesus inviting them to come and eat. Come and eat. For John, this was all too familiar. It all started here when he and Andrew had been listening to John the Baptist who pointed Jesus out to them. Behold, the Lamb of God. And John and Andrew, they had left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. And they had asked Jesus about himself and where he was staying. Does anybody remember Jesus' reply? In John chapter 1, verse 39, Jesus said to them, come and see. Come. And see, now he said, come and eat. Come. What an inviting word. Come. God used it to invite Noah into the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, he invites us to come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden, burden. It is a word used throughout the Bible. And it is used twice to close out the Bible. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it is used to invite those who desire Jesus, for those who desire his salvation. Revelation 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. It is an invitation to the saint and sinner alike to come to the one who takes away sin and sadness, and replaces it with joy and gladness. The disciples knew who their Savior was, but in verse 12, the disciples, they were also a little afraid of Jesus. They dared, didn't ask. They were in awe of Jesus, of his resurrection, of his authority over the grave, over the elements, over the fish. Their relationship had changed, different now, and they were hesitant. So he, Jesus, he met them where they were. He had anticipated their needs and made provision for them. So now he came and took the bread and fish and he fed them. In that culture, remember, to eat, to eat someone's food, it created a bond of friendship. That's why here in Calvary, we try to do a lot of eating. <laughs> it's not called Calvary, Calvary, Calvary Chapel. Jesus was reaching out to them. He was reaching out to them. They were hesitant. He was reaching out to them as he always does. Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. 
Verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus provided for them sustenance. That word means nourishment, source of strength to maintain someone or something in life or existence. Just as Jesus did here in John chapter 21 with his disciples, Jesus is always calling us to partake with him, partake of him. He will sustain us. He is our sustenance. The poet and greatest king of Israel, David, in the 34th Psalm, he said it perfectly. In verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 34, 8. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We are to taste that which is good, that which sustains, that which is forever. That is Jesus. That is Jesus. No one will ever replace Jesus. It is always about Jesus. If you are hurting, if you are going through something, whatever it is, and you are burdened, you are weary, Jesus is the answer. We just need to make that decision to seek him. He's right next to us right now. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you, and I thank you for your son. Lord, that, first of all, that you sent your son to us. You gave us the gift of your son. But as a gift, we need to receive your gift. And then you also give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. But we need to receive the Holy Spirit, Lord. Receive. It's an action made from a decision. I do not know everyone's heart in here or listening on the radio or online or watching live stream, but God does. Jesus always knows. And I don't know what you're going through, but if you're hurting, do not leave here tonight without doing business with God. I just pray, Father in heaven, that you just put it on people's hearts if they're hurting to come forward, to seek you out, to pray to you, to ask for the Holy Spirit to comfort them, to encourage them. Lord, as we're going to have pastors and elders up here Lord, by your spirit, just speak to people to come and do business. Lord, it is your spirit that draws people to you. And I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you do that. In the name of your son, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please, again, if you need prayer, don't leave without just coming forward. Okay? And if you're all good, God bless, and we'll see you.